So ladies and gentlemen, for this second panel in the African Growth Opportunities segment, I'd like to welcome to the stage His Excellency Pre President Philippe Nusi of Mozambique, President Alassane Ouattara of Cote d'Ivoire, and Prime Minister Pravin Jagnot of Mauritius. Welcome, Heads of State. Um, may I start with you, President Nusi, Mozambique? Um, now, I'll also follow um, Portuguese, um, Mash. Um, Mozambique has good opportunities for expanding the manufacturing and processing sector. What are, what are your government's plans to attract investments? Bom, primeiro, espero que todos estejam a ouvir. Oui, oui. Canal 4. A primeira resposta que seria, talvez fosse fácil, diria, primeiro, é exatamente isso que estamos a fazer agora. Vir ao encontro dos investidores, falar para os investidores sobre Moçambique, e este é o primeiro passo e é fundamental. Vou falar, quando falamos, fez a pergunta para Moçambique, mas podia servir também para toda a África. Moçambique é um país, posso considerar virgem ainda, em termos de riqueza. É o seu subsolo, rico em minerais, é o solo que dá para fazer todo tipo de agricultura. Tenho, tido, tenho dito sempre que o mais fácil é dizer aquilo que não se faz, porque produz-se tudo. Mas também Moçambique tem o mar, tem o lagos, tem rios, tem águas interiores, que tem peixe, tem outra riqueza. Moçambique tem muitas fontes de energia. Solares, eólica, energia hídrica, carvão, gás, etc. Como se pode ver, mas o principal que existe em Moçambique é o capital humano. As pessoas suficientes para fazer isso. E geo, estrategicamente, Moçambique está posicionado num corredor. Dissemos isso, nós servimos a partir de Moçambique os países do Interlândia. Podemos servir mesmo o África Sul, podemos servir o Zimbábue, o Zâmbia, podemos servir o Malawi. E, assim, até Congo pode chegar até aí. Nós temos também reservas importantes no ecoturismo, temos praias e no Congo. Se pode fazer o turismo que nunca mais termina. Temos, como disse, pesca, essa pesca se pode cultivar no mar, nos lagos, etc. Agora, o que, quais são as estratégias inicialmente? Nós estamos a promover os investimentos, na verdade, públicos, mas também, e sobretudo agora, investimentos privados, com parcerias nacionais e estrangeiras. E essa é uma boa experiência. Nos últimos cinco anos que nós vivemos, os investimentos diretos estrangeiros foram fundamentais para levantar a nossa economia. Paralelo a isto, está o projeto de formação, formação do homem moçambicano, para poder saber fazer e fazer para Moçambique e as tecnologias modernas, estamos também a investir nesse sentido. Agora, qual é a nossa estratégia? Como temos estado a fazer? Primeiro, é fundamental a estabilidade. O país tem que estar estável, do ponto de vista de segurança, porque todos os investimentos só podem ter lugar, podem ser realizáveis com algum país seguro, onde as pessoas se sentem à vontade, onde se pode investir e, e esses investimentos possam progredir. A outra questão é o melhoramento do ambiente de negócios. Aqui nós temos uma plataforma onde estamos abertos com o setor privado. Temos encontros periódicos regulares onde falamos, onde discutimos os problemas, e não só nacionais, mas também com os estrangeiros. Nesse âmbito temos estado a simplificar os procedimentos, os procedimentos para a realização da economia, temos estado a reduzir, lutar pela redução da burocracia, só para ficar aquela burocracia que é necessária para se resolver problemas, temos estado a incentivar tanto incentivos fiscais, mas também, como disse, temos que combater a corrupção. A corrupção não no sentido profundo, como se pensa, mas a partir da pequena, Aquele que quando se chega a um serviço, quer prestar serviço, as pessoas pedem apoio disso, apoio daquilo, muitas das vezes as pessoas gostam de complicar isso, ou queremos promover o turismo, como que isso tem que ser feito. Então, esta é uma atividade também que, paralelo a isso, desincentiva quando a corrupção existe os investimentos. Então, temos estado a fazer esse trabalho. A outra parte, não menos importante, é a questão das políticas macroeconômicas. Essas têm que ser prudentes. Nós temos que aqui lutado pela redução da inflação. Eu recordo em 2016 tivemos por volta de 26% da inflação. Fizemos um trabalho, até agora estamos nos pontos 3.2, 3.5 a inflação. Isso é fundamental porque isso faz com que a economia e os investimentos não sejam, não sejam caros. A outra questão é a redução, evitar para que os riscos financeiros sejam, incomodem a economia. Então, trabalhamos para que nessa área da macroeconomia não haja, o, o investidor não tenha o receio de investir porque há riscos financeiros em Moçambique, como também a gestão da dívida pública. Sim, obrigada. Um, next question to President Ouattara. Um, Your Excellency, with Cote d'Ivoire currently one of the fastest growing economies in the world, what factors are enabling the increasing flows of FDI and private sector investments that are driving economic growth? Bien, je, je vous remercie, Madame. Je suis très heureux d'être là. Je voudrais remercier à nouveau le Premier ministre et tous les organisateurs. 
Je vais vous dire que euh, nous avons amené du soleil à Londres, hein, vous voyez, depuis, depuis deux jours, euh, des, des journées sans soleil, j'en suis heureux. La Côte d'Ivoire a fait des progrès impressionnants au cours des, des huit dernières années et cela va continuer euh, dans les sept années, dans les années à venir. Et en réalité, euh, il fallait mettre l'accent euh, sur euh, l'investissement privé. C'est ce que nous avons fait. Dans nos programmes d'investissement euh, depuis 2012, euh, nous avons euh, réussi à faire en sorte que 60% des investissements soient faits par le secteur privé. Et donc, les flux, bien sûr, d'investissement direct ont été très importants. Et ceci euh, n'est pas chose facile parce que nous avons hérité d'un pays qui sortait d'une crise post-électorale, qui a fait près de 3 000 morts avec euh, destruction des infrastructures, destruction de l'absence de l'administration et également euh, donc une situation économique catastrophique. Mais nous avons travaillé à remettre les choses sur pied. Et ceci demandait d'abord, bien sûr, qu'on on, on essaie d'améliorer la sécurité. Maintenant, c'est chose faite. Abidjan a le même degré de sécurité que Londres, et nous en sommes très fiers. Et il fallait également amener la paix. Nous l'avons fait via la réconciliation des Ivoiriens. Et euh, bien évidemment, la chose la plus importante pour le secteur privé, l'investissement privé, c'était d'améliorer le climat des affaires. Et moi, je suis heureux de dire que euh, quand on prend euh, le, les indices de la Banque mondiale, le World Doing Business, nous, sommes, nous avons près de 50 points d'amélioration. Quand nous prenons les indicateurs de Mo Ibrahim, donc, depuis six ans, nous sommes le pays qui a la meilleure performance. Et tout ceci a amené donc, ce pays à faire une croissance euh, extraordinaire de 8% par an en moyenne depuis 2012. Et il y a des années où nous avons atteint 10%, il y a certaines années où nous avons fait 7%, mais jamais moins de 7%. Et ce qui veut dire qu'à la fin de l'année prochaine, en 9 ans, nous aurons doublé le produit intérieur brut. Euh, et nous aurons donc augmenté de plus de 50% de revenus par tête d'habitants. Euh, ce qui se traduit par une réduction drastique du taux de pauvreté, euh, qui était plus de 50%, qui est maintenant aux alentours de 35%. Et nous continuerons dans cette voie. Et en réalité, il fallait choisir les secteurs les plus porteurs. La Côte d'Ivoire est un pays agricole. Nous, avons donc, euh, nous sommes le premier producteur mondial de cacao, le premier producteur mondial de noix de cajou, le premier producteur africain de bananes, le premier producteur africain d'ananas, le premier producteur africain d'EVA. Ce qui fait que euh, la deuxième phase de notre stratégie dont je parlerai tout à l'heure, c'est la transformation de ces produits agricoles. Mais pour le moment, la situation économique est, est florissante et le taux de pauvreté baisse et le taux de croissance est maintenu. J'ajoute que le taux d'inflation pendant cette période a été moins de 2% par an. Et le ratio de la dette sur le PIB aujourd'hui en Côte d'Ivoire est de 48%, ce qui est quand même un taux pas négligeable, très intéressant par rapport à tous les pays du monde. Et nous continuerons dans cette voie parce que nous avons une équipe gouvernementale solide, nous avons remis les Ivoiriens au travail et nous sommes confiants que la paix, la sécurité permettront de faire en sorte que la Côte d'Ivoire continue sur cette lancée. Merci, madame. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Um, Prime Minister Jagnon, if I may. Um, Mauritius has clearly been a leader and an early mover um, in manufacturing-led development. We've heard from a number of economies today who have talked about being very primary in their economic drivers in terms of the, the level of processing is still very primary. Um, what lessons can you share from Mauritius's experience with other countries and with our audience, of course, of how to actually evolve an economy from primary to tertiary sectors? Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Quist, and let me express my appreciation to the remarks of uh, Excellencies Yusi and Watara. As you pointed out, uh, the question, uh, Chair, Mauritius has been able to attract and retain investments since uh, its independence in 1968. Diversification, in fact, has been the key to our economic success, and industrialization was imperative to start this process. However, we only had very few local entrepreneurs, and they had limited skills and capital. So we strive to attract foreign entrepreneurs, willing to use our resources, mainly labor, and invest in the manufacturing sector, originally geared towards textile and sugar production. And after, unfortunately, I must say, the erosion of preferential market access, the gains from those industries were reinvested in the development of tourism, thus marking, in fact, our first step in the services uh, industry. We have since then developed the tertiary sector to include financial services, the ICT BPO, and professional services. And today, the services sector contributes to over 75% of our total GDP although the manufacturing sector still remains, on a stand-alone basis, the main single contributor. Mauritius has been able to maintain a strong industrial base whilst also successfully diversifying the economic activities. And in terms of business environment, which is one of the main determinants of attracting foreign direct investments and increasing economic activity, Mauritius has made a tremendous leap forward. Just as Cote d'Ivoire, we were ranked 13th out of 190 countries in the World Bank ease of doing business index for this year. We are, of course, aiming to graduate further, and we want to become amongst the world's top 10 performers. So if I can attribute our success in establishing resilient economy to the following factors, putting in place very strong institutions, 
focusing on infrastructure development and promoting a culture of inclusiveness, continuously improving our business environment, remaining very much open to foreign investments and talents, and of course, last but not least, investing heavily in education and training. Thank you very much uh, for that, Prime Minister Jagnod. I, I want to pick up on your last point about investing in education. Uh, we heard about Tatu from a different country, but she talked about the right skills and the creation of quality jobs for all. As you continue your transition as an economy um, into even much, um, you know, a more sophisticated, um, and a more sophisticated economy, um, how will you provide the right skills and training for, to create the right quality of jobs for the future? Well, indeed, Mauritius is already an upper middle income economy, and we will soon hopefully join the League of the High Income Countries. With the per capita income already reaching now 12,050 US dollars in 2018, Mauritius is just about 325 US dollars short of the high income threshold that has been set by the World Bank. Now, there has been a marked improvement in income distribution, and uh, we are hoping that more progress will be made in the years to come. The share of total income going to households at the lower end of the income range has increased, and it is important to quote the figures, from 5.3% in 2012 to 5.7% in 2017. The Gini coefficient has decreased from 0.414 to 0.400 during the same period. So to achieve further improvement, we are embarking on an ambitious development strategy by focusing on new high growth potential sectors, such as the ocean economy, the digital economy, renewable energy, and life sciences. Our path to a modern and inclusive high income economy will rest mainly, again, on investing in the knowledge, skills, and abilities of our human capital, as these have been and remain our most precious resources. We have recently adopted an inclusive education system where each individual has an opportunity for educational progress. Now, Mauritius has, over the last few years, come forward with a range of schemes and programs that focuses on improving productivity of the existing labor force through continuous professional development programs, incentivizing companies to recruit and train fresh graduates, retraining and upskilling of both employed and unemployed youth, and matching the needs of the private sector to existing future skills. We have also taken a very historical measure by providing access to free education up to tertiary level to all Mauritian citizens in all public institutions. We recognize that for some sectors that we wish to develop, we do not have the local expertise, and as I have mentioned previously, we are open to foreign talents. We have a number of channels which foreign experts, startups, and high caliber professionals can come to work and live in Mauritius. And we have also set parameters to ensure that there is adequate diffusion of skills to the local people. So all along, we have made sure that the jobs that we create are decent and reduce inequality. I have recently introduced a modern and comprehensive employment legislative framework, in fact, to promote decent wages and sustainable development, including a minimal applicable salary across all sectors and a negative income tax regime for low-income employees. So these are how we are moving forward to have a more equal and fairly distribution of the wealth of the country. Thank you very much for that. If I can come back to you, President Yusi. Um, so in Mozambique, it's about 75% of the population that's engaged in agriculture. So my question is, as we talk about attracting investment to Africa, and particularly in your case to Mozambique, how will you ensure that that investment is of benefit to everyone in Mozambique and not just the people who are outside um, the agriculture sector? Boa pergunta, como saiba, nós tomamos posse já na quarta-feira, significa que o meu governo só tomou posse no, no sábado passado. E um dos problemas que temos estado aí a, a tratar eh, intensivamente é exatamente a justiça social. A justiça social significa os bens, a riqueza que existe em Mozambique, aquelas que eu falei no início, tem que beneficiar em primeiro lugar o nacional, o moçambicano. Mas para tal, estamos a mobilizar os investimentos estrangeiros, mesmo nacionais, mas estrangeiros, para poder vir operar em Moçambique. Neste caso, estou aqui neste país e aproveito para convidar aqui o, 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 os britânicos para poder investir em Moçambique. Exatamente, nós estamos através da diversificação. Queremos que haja mais emprego para os moçambicanos. Essa é uma das formas como poder beneficiar. E esse é o slogan que nós usamos agora, que é trabalho, trabalho, trabalho. Estamos primeiro a formar, a dedicar a formação técnico-profissional. Significa dar o saber fazer à nossa população. Para quando chegar os investimentos estrangeiros em Moçambique, em diferentes áreas, tem que absorver ver, na maioria, acima de 90 tal por cento, os nacionais. Essa é uma das formas de que essa riqueza, ainda hoje, esta manhã, tive, tive um encontro com mais uma entidade eminente deste país, quando falávamos sobre o turismo, o turismo comunitário, que há vezes que vem pessoas operam o turismo em Moçambique, mas nos, em, cada 100, em cada 100 dólares, ou 100 euros, ou 100 libras que, que recebem em Moçambique, apenas 5 é que ficam para Moçambique. Então, neste caso, nós vamos capacitando mais pessoas, vamos formando mais pessoas e, e vamos conseguir fazer isso. Outra questão é mesmo do emprego, porque, por exemplo, nós agora temos uns projetos ligados que estão em Moçambique, 
possam vir. E esses projetos, estão, estamos a trabalhar com eles para que haja o, o conteúdo local. Quando trazem os investimentos, os trabalhos terciários têm que ser feitos pelos moçambicanos. Se é para fornecer alimentação, tem que ser moçambicano. Se é para produzir ovo, tem que ser moçambicano. Porque vão incomodando, vão acomodando, vão empregando muita gente, incluindo gente estrangeira. Então, nesse aspecto, nós estamos, temos muitas formas, incluindo a promoção dos PMAs, acho que são as pequenas e médias empresas que existem. Como que são? O fomento. Eu tenho uma empresa que é empresa britânica, que trabalha em Moçambique, que chama-se Plexas, está na escola da promoção de algodão, como sua vocação. O que tem estado a fazer, produz sim, tem aquelas machamas que são comuns, que pertencem à empresa. Mas eles fomentam o algodão. Portanto, aqueles camponeses, singulares que estão aí, e familiares, etc. Eles são dados também oportunidades para produzir e eles assistem, assistem com fumigação, as técnicas de, de produção, etc. E vendem, eles compram esse produto do camponês. Então, tem uma maneira de empoderar o camponês, colocar o mercado ao lado do camponês e atos como esse surgem em muitas áreas, incluindo, como disse, falei aqui, no turismo comunitário, podíamos ter falado também de umas outras atividades de produção. Obrigada. E se eu posso fazer a última questão para o Monsieur? Madame. Similar to Mozambique, What are the opportunities in Côte d'Ivoire to turn jobs in lower productivity sectors into higher skilled positions, speaking particularly about rural populations? Je vous remercie. En fait, je pense que nous avons les mêmes contraintes. La différence est que la Côte d'Ivoire est un pays d'abord agricole, ce qui veut dire qu'il y a un bon tiers de la population qui est déjà dans le secteur agricole, et ce qui est une bonne chose. Et quand on investit donc dans le secteur rural, que ce soit l'eau potable, l'électricité, les écoles, la santé, on réduit la pauvreté dans le secteur agricole. Et j'ai indiqué tout à l'heure, sur un certain nombre de produits, la Côte d'Ivoire a donc des performances exceptionnelles. Alors maintenant, pour le reste de l'économie, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire C'est d'abord la question de l'éducation et de la formation des jeunes. Et nous, nous avons, depuis 2012, décidé que l'école est obligatoire jusqu'à l'âge de 16 ans. Et pour les familles défavorisées, bien sûr, le, le gouvernement aide les parents à, à, à payer les, les fournitures et tout ce qu'il faut pour que les enfants puissent aller à l'école. Et nous avons développé toute une série de lycées et d'écoles de, de formation technique euh, pour que dans le domaine, par exemple, des nouvelles technologies, le domaine du tourisme et dans d'autres secteurs, les jeunes puissent être formés pour pouvoir avoir un emploi. Parce qu'en réalité, c'est ça l'avenir. Une jeunesse bien formée est une jeunesse donc qui s'enracine et qui peut également éviter d'aller se jeter dans la Méditerranée ou dans le Sahara pour avoir euh, donc un peu plus d'espoir. Et cela étant, euh, nous avons essayé de créer un certain nombre d'universités. Notre ambition, c'est d'avoir à peu près 10 universités en Côte d'Ivoire par rapport aux trois que nous avions quand je suis arrivé aux affaires dans les années à venir. Donc une université par grande région euh, donc, euh, de la Côte d'Ivoire. Et voyez-vous, madame, pour que euh, tout cela marche, il faut tout de même qu'il y ait une stratégie de développement, une stratégie d'attraction des investissements privés. Également, de délocation des ressources dans les meilleurs secteurs, ça veut dire le problème de gouvernance, les problèmes d'encadrement de la jeunesse, les problèmes d'aider les femmes, qui sont quand même fondamentales de la population, à avoir des sources de financement. Nous avons mis en place un, un fonds qu'on appelle le fonds d'appui aux femmes de Côte d'Ivoire, qui permet aux femmes, euh, même dans le milieu rural et bien sûr dans le milieu urbain, euh, de, de voir 300 euros, euh, par exemple, de, de crédit, euh, avec un taux d'intérêt très faible, pour pouvoir euh, commencer des activités euh, limitées. Je sais que le temps vient, mais c'est important que je vous le dise, parce que nous tenons à ce que ce programme ait un appui des institutions multilatérales, la Banque mondiale, la Banque africaine, mais également la Grande-Bretagne. Parce que euh, nous avons déjà plus de 200 000 femmes qui profitent de ce crédit. Et une femme s'occupe d'à peu près 6 à 7 personnes. Ça veut dire que c'est plus d'un million de personnes oui. qui sont déjà prises en charge. Donc notre objectif, c'est d'accentuer euh, nos efforts pour l'éducation, la, la formation des jeunes et la mise en place des outils de crédit et de développement donc, des femmes également. Donc moi, je voudrais vous remercier parce que c'est une opportunité de dire que la Côte d'Ivoire est un pays qui, fait les, qui a fait des efforts extraordinaires. Je salue les, mes compatriotes qui m'ont fait confiance depuis 9 ans et je leur dis que nous continuerons dans cette voie. Et je suis persuadé que les taux de croissance de 7 à 8 que nous avons connus depuis 9 ans continueront sur les 9 à 10 ans à venir. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, voilà. monsieur. Merci. Um, thank you very much, um, Your Excellencies, for a very candid, open and honest um, um, panel discussion where you shared, um, you know, quite frankly, where your countries are and the progress you've made and, and more insights of where, to, where you're going and the things we can learn from. Um, thank you very much it's been an honor and thank you very much ladies and gentlemen um, as, our, uh, as your excellencies leave the stage um, together I'd like to remind us that um, the day is not over and so as your excellencies leave the stage vous pouvez passer par là. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have a short break, um, and then after the break, we'll be starting our closing session. Please be here. You don't want to miss Do Dr. Konjo Iwela and all the other uh, people who will be presenting with us in that last section. Thank you very much.
Chapman. Please welcome to the stage your moderator for the day, Lucy Quist. I know you've had a great day. It's been a wonderful, inspiring, insightful day, and we have one more segment to bring all the insights home and together. We've heard from leaders, and we've heard from governments. We've heard from global institutions, and we've heard from entrepreneurs. So let's watch this short video that brings together some of the lessons we've learned today. She previously served as Nigeria's finance minister and as managing director at the World Bank, as well as an advisor to Lazar. Dr. Iwela, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I see we have a bit of color coordination going on here. Yeah, I think this is an African thing. Well, the thing is, when I grow up, I want to be like you, of course, so <laughs> I, I think I'm on the right track. Thank you. <laughs> um, Dr. Ngozi, um, we have had a very insightful day. Um, and if there's anyone who knows Africa from both the private and public sector, it's you. So would you mind sharing it with us some perspectives um, of, from what you've heard from the issues discussed today? Well, thank you so much, Lucy. I, I think I'd like to make four points since we don't have a great deal of time. The first one is about the gathering itself. The first observation is this multi-stakeholder gathering that we have that brings together the public sector, the private sector. I've seen a lot of civil society. I've seen a lot of young entrepreneurs. Um, I, I really want to commend and compliment the UK government for pulling it all together. So uh, this is the kind of I think gatherings we need to have, you know, to move things on the continent. I'll come back to this point because we do have this also going on on the continent, but I think today, that was my first observation, the amount of energy that has been generated by pulling this multi-stakeholder approach uh, together. I think the second point I'd like to make is that I'm going to use a word that one of my sons uses all the time. I don't know if it's in the dictionary, it's positivity. <laughs> is it a real word? <laughs> there was so much positivity in the atmosphere here today um, from two sides. First, from our leaders, our presidents, I listened to them talk about what they are doing in our countries, in order and on the continent, in order to generate the environment, the enabling environment for the private sector. Um, we've got uh, some of the big continental achievements, like the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, there are some ways here who have been leading that. With our leaders, talked a lot about that and what it means for their countries. We talked about uh, a lot of doing business achievements. Eight of our countries are now in the top 100, and so many others have made a lot of progress on doing business. I know we still have a long way to go, but that's very positive. There's a lot being done to, to spur growth. We've got a lot of structural reforms. We've got value-added manufacturing that is going on Cote d'Ivoire, transforming cocoa all along uh, Senegal, you know, President Makisal, um, uh, Nigeria. We are all doing things in our countries. President Buhari is here to try to spur investment. So there was a lot of positive things. On that note, I think the one thing that came through is jobs. Every one of our leaders is conscious of the need to do these reforms in order to create jobs. And we have a lot of young entrepreneurs. Um, let me give a shout out to you win women who are here from Nigeria. They're young entrepreneurs who were supported. And there are quite a lot of them from Nigeria who have created jobs. Let me also say from the side of business, I heard a lot of positive. In fact, there's so much of a positive environment. I'm beginning to feel nervous. <laughs> Because it's when, real, Dr. It's real. <laughs> when you go to a gathering for Africa, all you hear about is challenges. But it is unique to this meeting. Investors, I listened to a panel where they were talking about how to raise resources uh, for, for the corporate investment on the continent, on the London Stock Exchange, the billions that have been raised, standard bank, standard chartered. But the one thing I want to draw out there is so there was a lot of talk about sustainable infrastructure investment. So green financing being raised, Africa still has two thirds of its infrastructure to be built. And we have the opportunity to lead by doing it in a sustainable and green way. So that was a positive. And then finally, there was also, well, we're very happy to be here in this environment. We brought African investors, we brought UK investors, we brought our leaders here. And um, it's all going very well. But there's one thing I want to take back. A lot of the young people were saying to me, we also need the investors to come to us. So my wish is that we would be able to translate this energy because on the continent, we've got several initiatives. We've got the Sharm El Sheikh 
uh, conference in Egypt, we've got the CEO conference in Cote d'Ivoire, we've got the African Development Bank Investor Conference in Joburg, so we also want to move them in that direction. Absolutely, I, I, I couldn't agree more that if we're going to discover and learn about the continent and understand the continent, then we have to physically be there as well on the ground. So Dr. Ngozi, can you say a little about what you see as the main challenges for governments um, to encourage more private investment in African markets, both domestically and internationally? I would say to maybe three things very quickly. The first one is infrastructure and logistics. Um, again, a lot of the comments I've heard here is we need to get our energy story right. We need to get electricity roads, ports right. We need to get digital as well. We need technology um, with telecommunications. So there's a lot of, I think, the emphasis on governments trying to invest, but that's also an opportunity because uh, this is why we're here. If we have those challenges, then we're also saying to investors, this is an opportunity for you to invest. The second area is on the macroeconomy. Uh, I think we've done very well uh, in the 2000s on the continent, leading up to the financial crisis of 2008, but somehow um, we are seeing some slippages, and I think we need to pull back to get inflation under control, to get exchange rates right, uh, to get macro stability in place. I think without that, we're going to experience more challenges. So macro conditions, structural conditions, I said the presidents are working on diversifying, but we need to do more of that. I think the last is still the work we need to do on doing business. Like I said, we're making progress, but there's still a lot of bureaucracy, the red tape. Um, eight of our countries are in the top 100, but the remaining, remaining are in the bottom 100. So the issue is, what do we need to do on the micro challenges in order to make, uh, make the environment friendly for our domestic business and investors, first of all? and then for foreign investors. Excellent, so I feel as though with my next question, you've probably answered a bit of it already, but I'll still ask whether you think there are any other main challenges for businesses and investors, um, and what we need to do to encourage more of that investment into Africa. Well, uh, maybe from the investor side, I think there's the issue of risk. Um, you know, the, the many investors see Africa as risky, and I think the perception of risk is probably much higher than the actual risk itself. Mm -hmm. So we have all those Fitch and Standard and Poor's and their ratings, but I think we need to step back and ask those who have been doing business, who are taking the long view on the continent, what are their returns and what is the actual risk? Um, so that risk perception is there and we need to, to, to the business needs to relook at this and to pull back. I think the other thing the business is looking at is policy instability. Um, a lot of businesses uh, fear that, you know, policies that are put in place in one administration or one government may change or, you know, a, a tax policy or something is proclaimed and then it's changed down the line. And that kind of policy uncertainty, um, you know, is something they also talk about. But I just want to say, take the long view on the continent is a continent of the future. Don't look at short term. I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, 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 the view of just investing quickly to get out is what probably leads to some of the perceptions or heightened perceptions of risk. Um, I have one final um, comment, uh, question for you. Of course, from the outset, you'd be very complimentary about the UK um, government in organizing this summit. And I strongly agree with you as well, that's why I'm in this seat. Um, but can you say a little more about the UK's role in all that you describe? And what UK-Africa um, partnerships you look forward to going further out of this conference? Well, I, I think, um, first of all, yes, I sincerely meant it when I said that, look, Brexit is around the corner. If one of the first things the government does is organize a conference centered on Africa, then it, it, it seeks to underline how important this relationship is. And as was said before, 1.2 billion consumers, 2.5 trillion in GDP, the market, you know, we will have the largest number of young people, billion consumers, 2.5. It seeks to underline how important this relationship is. And as was said before, 1.2 billion young consumers, 2.5 trillion in GDP, the market, you know, we will have the largest number of young people by 2030. All this makes Africa a good partner. So I think the UK is building on historical ties. Um, so you see here that members of the Commonwealth are here, but it's also building modern ties and reaching across beyond the Commonwealth to pull in. Um, it's fantastic to see that this is about Africa, not a particular group of African countries. So I think building on the do is very clever. I think that the UK, you know, I'm going to say something here too, that um, Africans also feel, feel a tie uh, with the UK. The two, two parts of the world are linked culturally, um, sports-wise, uh, who defeated who yesterday? Liverpool defeated Man U, right? And it was Mo Salah's goal, right? From Egypt. Please, let's, let's not go down that <laughs> route should, right now. We should, we should I'm don't, very sad. We should don't, yo, oh, are you a Man U fan? Okay, all right. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, so we've got our Africans who are playing here in different teams. We've got cultural ties. You know, I, I used to also joke for my own country, Nigeria. Now, I once said, what's the second largest city in Nigeria? And everybody was looking at me and I said, London. <laughs> so, so we've got all these uh, ties. And I think jokes apart that uh, building on these ties in a modern way uh, is what the UK is trying to do. And I think as Africans, we have shown our willingness by coming here and engaging uh, because we expect for the future that we will be a key market 
Uh, it's not only for the UK to sell, but what happened in Prime Minister Boris Johnson's speech, he also mentioned tea from Kenya coming. There'll be chocolate and cocoa and coffee from Cote d'Ivoire. There'll be uh, manuf uh, textiles and fashion coming from, uh, from Africa. There'll be, you know, manufactured products that will come from the continent here and back. Dr. Ngozi, it has been my singular pleasure to have this conversation with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, one thing's for certain, African women are powerhouses in their own right. You can clap. <laughs> Throughout the day, you've heard from many entrepreneurs, and I have to bring you one more amazing entrepreneur, the last one of the day, and her name is Nabukosi Dlamini, who has joined us all the way from South Africa. Nabukosi, please join us. She is the founder and CEO of a tech startup, Bahati Tech. Now, because you're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. There's a little story here because um, now because you um, had to change your you have to change your flight. That's correct. Um, because your name got spelt wrong, and so you didn't make you make your flight. You had to get another flight. But she still made it first thing this morning. So this woman has flown in all the way from South Africa, arrived this morning, and she's with us, looking brighter and fresher than I am on this stage. So now because you, how has the day gone for you so far? What are some of your main takeaways from this summit? Thanks, Lucy. I think it's been a very exciting day for me to see all the creativity that our fellow entrepreneurs have brought forward, um, and they've showcased the services and products that they want to bring to the African continent as well as to the UK. So it's been really amazing also to see different stakeholders come together from trade partners, governments, as well as um, investors to say these are the opportunities that are available for entrepreneurs. And you know, Lucy, they say that success is when preparedness meets opportunity. Absolutely. So um, as entrepreneurs, we are prepared to take um, hold of these opportunities that um, this summit has presented us with. And I think it's going to be an exciting decade for the African entrepreneur, especially female entrepreneurs. I'm so happy to see so many female entrepreneurs here today from Africa. So we're looking forward to working with the UK, to working across the African continent. Excellent. You mentioned opportunities. I need to take you up on that. Yes. What are the main opportunities ahead to drive structural transformational change? I think the biggest opportunity that um, is ahead of us right now is um, increased collaboration for us as entrepreneurs to take hold of bigger opportunities in the market. Um, I see there's a lot of talk about investment and financing for, for businesses, and that will allow us to scale not only um, in our individual continent, but also into other parts of the world. My colleague, um, Charles, this morning mentioned that African solutions are not only applicable in the African context, Absolutely. but can be applied in other areas the of the solution. world. So we're very, we're very keen to showcase what our talents are, what our creativity is, and um, I think with uh, an enabling environment, um, with the access to market and financing that we require, um, it's going to be the year of the African entrepreneur. The year of the Af African entrepreneur, you heard it here first. Thank you very much, Nabukosi. Thank you. And so our last but one speaker is the Deputy Prime Minister and Head of, the, of Ethiopia's delegation, Minister Demeki Mekonen, who will join us now on the stage and share his thoughts from Ethiopia. Thank you.